sao Ing ring shring Ka e ni la ring Ha sa ka ha la ring Sa ka la ring Sao ain kling ring shring Namaste. <laughs> no, I'm not getting a facial. <laughs> this is Bhasma, Vibhuti. And there's, if you need to know what that is, there's a whole series on it right here. Anyway, I just got the inspiration to tell this story. And so I thought I would share it while it's fresh in my mind. Because it's very relevant to what's going on in my life today. How I got the call. Huh? Everybody who is blessed, who is a real devotee of God, or who is marked for self-realization in this life, at some point in their life gets the call. <laughs> and I've done a whole series on it. The call of the friend which you can view here. This will be the last episode of it. So how I got the call? Well, first of all, we have to understand what the call is. The call is a message from God. Hoover, Hoover, Noah. Who is that? It's the Lord. Noah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Saying, I want you for a specific service. So your life is now dedicated to the service of God. You don't have a lot to say about it. It's like, Right. <laughs> so how it happened to me? It was a little bit after my third birthday, Easter time in the spring, April. And I was with my family in the church. Family was very involved with the church. And so naturally I tagged along. They were decorating the church for Good Friday and Easter. So they were putting up lots of lily plants and palm leaves and flowers and stuff like that. It was very beautiful. But you know, I was just a boy, three years old. I couldn't really help. So they stuck me in a pew <laughs> and said, just watch what we do now. So I was sitting there in the pew, looking around the church. And I noticed one of the stained glass windows. In fact, earlier my mother had pointed it out to me that this is Good Friday and this is what happened on Good Friday or the night before Maundy Thursday that Jesus and his disciples were praying in the garden. So I was looking at this beautiful stained glass window. It's really very nicely done a devotional picture. And it suddenly hit my three-year-old brain. He's talking with God. Now, this is not a big deal for an adult, but for a three-year-old, it's a big insight. He's talking with God, not just praying, having a conversation. He was also hearing. My very next thought was, I'm going to do that. Because I had heard in the church itself that Jesus said, whatever I do, you shall also do. And you'll do even better than me. <laughs> of course, they never talk about that in the Sunday sermon. <clears throat> they want to make Jesus unapproachable superhuman. Now, they do the same thing with Buddha in Buddhism and Krishna in Hinduism and Shiva and so on. 
They make them so beyond, you know, that you have no hope to even approach them. But actually, they're all human. They're all human. They're just like you and me. But they dealt with it effectively. They learned the spiritual lessons, put them into practice in their lives. So here I get this huge insight. Boom. Huh? And by the way, this was right around the time, within a few days, of when Ramana Maharshi left his body. Ramana Maharshi, as you know, or you should know, if you watch this channel, <laughs> is one of our big inspirations. And certainly one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Advaita teacher of the 20th century. So anyway, right around this time, I get this huge insight. And boom, it changed my whole life. I had a mission. I had a purpose. I had a goal. And of course, you know, being just a little kid, the first thing I was thinking was, well, I got to find somebody to teach me how to do this. And right away, I mean, I knew my, my family <laughs> and the local minister, they were out of, out of the picture. Uh, they weren't doing these things. And later on, you know, I got to meet like the bishop and, and all this, and, and he was just, he was totally out of it. He was just a PR guy for the church. Wasn't a mystic, wasn't a yogi. So it set me on a long search. And I finally, I was introduced to my Adi Guru when I was 25 years old. But that's another story. This story is about the call. So how do you, when you're three years old, how do you deal with a world that is trying its best to divert you from anything resembling a spiritual purpose and to pull you out and engage you in all kinds of material activities? This was my first big concern, my big worry in life. These people are trying to teach me how to be like them, and I don't want to be like them. I've been given a mission. I've been called. And you don't disrespect that call. That is, unless you want a lot of trouble in your life. And a few days later, I had a dream. This is a wild, wild dream for a three-year-old. I was on Neptune, or one of Neptune's moons. I was on this planet, and before me was a lake of liquid methane. How did I, at three years old, know that this was liquid methane? I don't know. I don't know, but it gets weirder. <laughs> then comes a flying saucer over the lake, and a doorway like an iris opens in the bottom of the saucer and out comes this creature which is like like a cloak or a piece of cloth big piece of cloth like a rug almost thick huh like a rug but basically square and it's just floating it has kind of a nucleus in the center but then the rest of it was pretty flat and it's just floating over this lake. It's, it's gray on the top side and glowing red on the bottom. So then I have this telepathic exchange with this creature, whatever this thing is. And it says, I am your cloak to protect you from the world. But I want to wrap myself around you, but I need your permission. I can't do it without your assent. So I thought about it for about a second. And then I said, yeah, come on, I need you. I need you to help me to not be deviated from my mission, from my purpose. So this thing comes and wraps itself around me like a cloak. And then I woke up. <laughs> so interestingly enough, 
This call, this mission, this purpose protected me. As I was going through school, for example, I knew somehow or other in my young little mind that what I was being taught was bullshit. I could see this is not about learning. This is about social control and training to follow authority. Because all the stuff they were teaching us was useless. In the fourth grade, we were supposed to learn all these multiplication tables, right? And my uncle was an aeronautical designer, an aeronautical engineer. I was visiting him at his place and he has a big drawing table and all kinds of instruments, really cool stuff. And there's a slide rule on his desk. And I pick it up and I say, what's this? And he tells me, oh, you can do multiplication and division with that. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so he said, do you think you can figure it out? Well, it took me about five minutes to figure it out. You position the index on one number, and then you move the slide thing to another number, and you get the product on the A-axis. Anyway, he said, well, that's pretty good. How about I'll give you my old one? So he gave me this old, very simple slide rule. His was like a triplex log log, whatever, you know, engineering slide rule which was way over my head, but he gave me a simple slide rule. So, of course, I was really uh, stoked about this, and I took it home with me, learned to use it quite well within about a day. <laughs> and then the next day was show and tell. So I brought it to school, and I was going to, you know, do a little presentation on it. But before show and tell was math class. So I was just sitting there in math class doing my multiplication stuff, you know, multiplication problems with my slide rule. And the teacher comes over and says, what are you doing? Oh, I said, I'm doing my multiplication. Why are you cheating? I'm not cheating. I got the right answers, didn't I? Well, she didn't buy this and I didn't buy her trip. So I wound up in the principal's office. And he gave me the same nonsense. I, I said, no, this is, I'm doing college level work. My uncle is an engineer. He gave me this thing. I figured out how to use it in five minutes. You know, you should be rewarding me, not punishing me. Oh, he didn't like that. He called my mother. Then the same conversation repeated again. She said exactly the same thing I did. <laughs> she said, He's a bright boy. He figured out this all by himself. Let him use it. What's the problem? Isn't he getting the right answers? Isn't he solving the problems? No, no. They have to memorize all these tables, right? Now, here we are, what, 40 years later, 45 years later? Does anybody use multiplication tables anymore? No. Everybody has a calculator on their phone. Duh. So I was just like ahead of my time. But I could see from this incident that school was not about learning because learning was punished and just obedience is the only thing that was acceptable. So this protected me. And so I didn't accept, you know, I did whatever I had to do to get through school and get halfway decent grades. So just to keep my parents happy. But really, I knew it was all bullshit. I knew that all the stuff they were teaching us, for example, in social studies was nonsense because I, I had a stack of National Geographic magazines at home that I inherited from my grandfather. Boy, if I had those today, they'd be worth a ton of money. But anyway, I could go look things up. I could go to the library and read books about the stuff they were telling us and it was all wrong. The real truth was available to me, and so I went out and found it. And of course, that made me a social pariah at school. I didn't care, you know. I had a handful of friends, really intelligent friends, who later on went on to become doctors and engineers and scientists, 
like that. But that's a whole nother story. This is about how I got the call. And now I'm very happy to report to you that my mission has been successful. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. <laughs>